Many thanks, Julie. And our final speaker is Shakira Hussain. So I'd invite you to uh, welcome Shakira to the podium. So you've heard of not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, but I can't stand up and think clearly at the same time, so I'm okay. okay. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that Virginia has gone out of her way to interact with local Muslims here in Canberra. I can see quite a few faces in the audience who've been at these events that Virginia has attended and she's given of her time to community events as well. And she has also heard our opinions expressed at sometimes interminable length, including by me. So, you know, um, it's a long process, perhaps, but an interesting one. And I'd also like to speak, sort of, there's issues of definitions of what garment we're talking about, and I'll just say briefly that really what's under discussion here is any form of veiling the face, whether it's called a burqa or, an, or a niqab, or a chador, and there's different garments that cover women's faces, and there's different names sometimes applied to the same garment, that burqa, Afghan-style garment with the net grill across the face, is often referred to in Pakistan as a shuttlecock burqa to distinguish it from other kinds of burqas, from other, from other forms of achieving really the same effect, which is just basically, you know, to, to cover, to cover up everything. And so although the discussion today relates to Australia, I'd like to begin by talking about Pakistan. And I acknowledge that it's quite a different act to be covering in Pakistan than here, and there's quite different conditions, but I'll, I'll get to that. There are, it is still a minority of Pakistani women who cover their faces on a full-time basis. There are many Pakistani women, perhaps most, who wear a scarf across their shoulders like this. They may pull it over their hair at some points, and some will also pull it over their faces. You know, at times when they're being made to feel uncomfortable, perhaps when they're under particular scrutiny, or where they feel that they you know, want a little bit more shelter. But there are women who do cover more or less every time they leave their house. And in some cases, historically in Muslim societies, this has been a sign of elitism, that your family has so much income that you're not re really needing to venture out into public life, that you can afford to stay home. And when you um, leave your home, you're sort of taking a mobile shelter with you. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are women who cover because that's the only kind of privacy they can get. We often talk about a woman's right to participate in public life, and I support that right absolutely. But there are women who've been forced into public life in circumstances that aren't of their choosing. Certainly the shuttlecock burqa in some parts of Pakistan, it's perceived that women wearing that burqa are either beggars or prostitutes. I remember doing interviews among Afghan women in Peshawar, and my Afghan contact thought it was important for me to be interviewing some women who'd been reduced to that beggary and finding out how they had come to be in such horrible circumstances. So we looked for the shuttlecock burkas, the beggars, uh, but the first woman we approached turned out not to be a beggar. She turned out to be a prostitute. That's another circumstance in which you might not be really wanting to be recognized, wanting to be seen. Uh, and. Uh, you know, and that's, again, women whose homes are really not homes as we'd understand it, um, just makeshift shelters, well, their clothing is, again, the only form of shelter they can get. And once more, I acknowledge that women in Australia are not reduced to those kinds of conditions. This is just background. In Australia also, though, I haven't had much to do with women who habitually cover their faces because it's vanishingly rare among Muslims in Australia. And that is leading many Muslims to wonder why 
um, an issue that really relates to such a small number is being given such prominence. Muslims in France, incidentally, are asking the same question. And it's my perception from the, you know, by definition, limited contact I've had with these women, and also the perception of, of other people I've been talking to, that the women who do cover their faces in Australia are disproportionately converts, as like Rabia Hutchinson, who um, Virginia referred to. And so they're not bringing a custom from their homeland and importing it to Australia. They are adopting a religious norm that in fact isn't followed by most, mo most of the women in Muslim communities here uh, for reasons of their own and some converts are told and do accept that it's praiseworthy or not compulsory to cover your face. I don't think there are any Muslim women or Muslim men come to that who believe it's obligatory on theological grounds to cover your, your face. They think that you will get extra merit, perhaps, some, some, or some think that you'll get extra merit by doing so, but they, and, and some also think that it is religiously obligatory to cover your hair, but the face is something else again. So, um, women who cover their faces in Australia are choosing and again, I accept that there's problematics around that word choice, but they are taking up a form of life that is much more isolating than covering your face can be in Muslim countries. I spent a lot of time in Pakistan with women who belong to an, a religious political movement, and these women do habitually cover their faces around unrelated men, but that isn't very much of their time and they can lead quite full professional lives while doing so. They work in women's only schools or healthcare centres or offices. Uh, they participate in the political life of their parties. They hold public demonstrations, fully veiled of course, and the veil, by the way, helps to mitigate the transgression of holding a street demonstration. So, um, but in Australia, of course, you're either going to be covering your face every time you leave your home or you're not going to be leaving your home very much. And you're not going to be mixing with very many people. In Pakistan, you could be mixing with quite a lot of unrelated, well, quite a lot of related men too, because there are likely to be a lot of closely related men in your vicinity and in your household. And certainly you would be doing a lot of mixing with other women. I barely ever saw my Pakistani contacts who covered their faces. Well, I barely ever saw them with their face veil on. We were nearly always in places where it was unnecessary. In following those norms in Australia, you would feel it necessary to be covering your face much more of the time. So I would certainly be discouraging my daughter if she wanted to start covering her face, I'd be discouraging her from doing so, although frankly, looking at her sitting there and looking at the look on her face, I don't think there's much <laughs> chance of that. <laughs> but, um, but another thing I think we need to acknowledge in this discussion is that it can be hard sometimes to muster much enthusiasm to support the right of women to choose to cover when a great many of those women don't support the inverse right, the, the flip side of that. They don't support the right of women in Muslim majority societies to uncover. And in this case, we're talking about their hair, not their faces.